Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray. Uh, today, I am back home visiting my parents in the very deep, dark mountains of the Ohio Valley. So there's no green screen today. I didn't bring it along with me. Didn't have space to pack it in the car with my freaking kids and wife and dog and cats uh, to come on this great big uh, three-day event. So I'm sorry. You just get some raw footage of the background of my mother's uh, picture frames in the back here. So hope you don't mind. Uh, today, I will be, of course, as always, reviewing some recent and classic lit RPG audiobooks for you. Today, I'm going to begin with Betrayal, Monsters, Maces, and Magic, Volume 2, by Terry Irvin II, narrated by Jonathan Waters, with an 8 hours and 55 minutes runtime. Glenn sat in the rocking chair on the tailor's shop's porch. His stubby legs didn't allow his booted feet to reach the great wooden planks supporting the chair. They weren't his legs, or feet, really. They were those of a gnome healer named Jax, a character he'd rolled up for a game of monsters, maces, and magic. Until that fateful evening, Glenn had never even heard of that dice and paper role-playing game, although he'd played Dungeons & Dragons a few times back in junior high. The only reason he'd been at the gaming club was for a two-page reaction and analysis paper for Sociology 102. The objective was to interact with a group or subculture unfamiliar to him. Two other classmates showed up that night, and, like him, literally got drawn into the RPG world, stuck in the bodies of their dice-generated characters. One of the Sociology 102 students was dead killed by an ogre less than ten minutes after their arrival in what Ron called an aberrant concurrent world, or universe. Glenn couldn't keep it straight. Now, Terry Irvin Part Deux returns to his gamelet series, as I said, Monsters, Maces, and Magic, with his tale of betrayal. And I'll be honest, I've been waiting for this one. I absolutely loved the first book and could not wait for this book to hit the audible shelves, so to speak. Metaphorically, of course. I have to admit, I'm going to go into this. I felt certain. I going in. I just knew what was going to happen just from the title, um, from my last predictions in the last book. You kind of saw. I said, "Oh, I think I see something happening in the next book with one of the characters in the party." So I was like, "Oh, I just know what's going to happen here." But I was very surprised to find that I was so wrong about everything. Things that I had never expected had come to pass. So I'll give Terry his due. I love it when a writer sets up a story and then proceeds in diligence and in indomitable spirit to follow a path that is not expected by its readers. Uh, I don't want to give anything away. I really don't because it's a really good book. But I really thought it was pretty obvious where the book's title was coming from. But nope. 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 He got me. So kudos, Master Irvin. Uh, I give you the the head bow and the, the praying hands of awesomeness. So the book pretty much centers on the group, uh, if you want to remember from the first book, they become stuck in a game world. You know, it's sort of like uh, caverns and creatures or whatever it is, the same way that the people played the game and they got sucked into another world uh, without any consent, and they were just thrown into this head over heels, or as James Hunter says, ass over teacups. Uh, So they were sent here. And they've been trying ever so, well, I would say diligently, but they failed almost every attempt they've, they've made to find a way back. And their best best hope for that to occur is through Wish Spell. Uh, and so in order to do that, they've got to raise some serious cash because they had raised money to uh, revive one of their comrades who had died, and that failed. So they, they've now got no choice but to either come up with the gold to get them home or they're stuck where they are. And I actually think that from reading through this book, there are serious periods where some of the characters really prefer being here now than they do their own world, where they came from. And of course, you kind of have to see that because that is an escape world. It's, it's a world they go to to get away from the real world, the humdrum, the doldrums of the real world. So why wouldn't they enjoy living the life that they pretended to live? Uh, Now, of course, there's three people who, well, at least two people, but three people, uh, one of them died, uh, who want to get back to the real world, uh, you know, because this is not their idea of fun. They were doing this for a school project. So once you get into that kind of situation, I think about half the party really enjoys what they're doing. The other half's not so much. 
And so it creates tension and that sort of thing, which is really neat and cool uh, because they're not all on the same page. You know, most books, like if you read um, anything by Joel Rosenberg, you know, his Sleeping, you know, the Guardians of the Flame series, uh, they're all in it together. Even though, you know, in the first book, and I gave this away, one of the characters dies just really quickly, um, similar to this series. Um, the characters there all knew about the game except for one player, and that was Andy. Here, uh, not so much. They, there's half of the group, at least, have no clue what they're doing. They're in way over their heads, and they're just kind of trundling along, hoping for the best until they can get the hell out of the realms, okay? So, right now, the book pretty much centers on them trying to raise funds for this wish spell so they can turn home. And what happens is they get sucked into this uh, backstabbing and intrigue-dealing comes up about a kidnapped elven bride. Uh, the team opts to take the offer, even though the team that was ahead of them that originally had the job was way more advanced than they were. Okay, I mean, if you look at it, they were leaps and bounds. Like, they're level one, and these guys are like level nine at least. So they're going into this really underpowered compared to the first team that didn't make it. And I won't give away what happens to the first team. Um, but something really happens and they observe everything. So they know the other team was pretty tough in, in terms of power. Uh, so the team opts to take the offer and get some serious bread or dough or get cash or gold, however you want to put it, in exchange for bringing this runaway bride back. And they head off into the swamplands in hopes of rescuing her before she is violated, murdered, or eaten. Or violated, murdered, and then eaten. So she's in a bad place, the self-maiden with a deadline kind of hanging over her head. I mean, they know if they don't get there in time, something horrible is going to happen one way or the other, if it hasn't already occurred. So they've got no time to spare. And of course, getting through the swamps, there's all kinds of trials and tribulations there. They find out that she's being held by goblins. And, and if you know anything about goblins, you know, goblins are kind of like rats. If you see one, there's 10 hiding around a corner. If there's 10 around a corner, there's 50 of them in the, the corridor down the hall. You don't ever have two or three goblins, you've got hordes of goblins. So they've really kind of got to get their game faces set where they need to be. Uh, the group works pretty well together. They're play smart. And they learn, you know, where they're going, and they head out despite the adversity. Now, there is some things that come up. There's, and there's, they're told before they ever leave that they ha they the only real tr tr trouble they're going to encounter despite the, the the order or level difference between them and the other team is that they are going to be betrayed there's going to be a betrayal somewhere along the line and again this is where i said aha aha i know who's going to do this again very very wrong on my part so forgive me if i was arrogant and assume things because i do not like to assume anything uh, but i do that from time to time now you know the, the, the book has a lot of action. Uh, the battle scenes are pretty slick, and I love the way that they managed to take on a lance-wielding rider. It was pretty smooth. So there's a lot of innovative use of magics and tactics that go on, and the half-goblin, for me, pretty much steals the show. He's the most fun, and I think my biggest issue is just how weak the gnome is often portrayed to be. I mean, he's got stubby little legs, so he can't run quickly. I mean, honestly, I, I, I'm an adult, and I can tell you right now, if a five-year-old took off booking and was running away, I'm going to have a hard time catching a five-year-old, despite how stumpy their legs are. They got some speed in them their bones. That's what I'm saying. In fact, the old Bill Cosby joke, and I don't like to bring up Bill Cosby, but he, he pretty much says, if a child's holding something, and you go, give me that, and the kid goes like this, you can't grab it because they're doing this. And that's the way, to me, you know, gnomes, they shouldn't be considered slow. Or, like, if you read about hobbits, you don't see hobbits can't make it. I mean, hell, the hobbits trekked all the way from Hobbiton to Mordor on their feet. And they did it in a pretty quick uh, pace, you know, considering they didn't really have mounts for most of the way. So being short is a hindrance, but it doesn't mean that you are slow, so to speak, unless you dawdle. Um, and, and this group... You know, they don't dawdle, and I think the gnome, he, he should be able to run away quicker than most people. He, he should have more dodging ability than he does. Uh, he frets about everything, and to me, that's just 
I really wish he kicked more ass, and I hate to say it like that, but he always ends up coming across the liability, even when he's fighting his heart out. And he is the cat who saved the team in the last book. And yet he still doesn't have the confidence that he needs and the bravado. Um, he always goes into everything thinking, oh, God, I'm going to get killed right here. I don't want to look. I'm just going to try not to die. I'm going to protect them and, and do what I can. But his main goal is not to get killed every time he goes into battle, which, I mean, if you think about it, that really should be your goal is not to get killed. Uh, I know that would be my goal. However, uh, you know, the 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 one evil, black, uh, maligned uh, member of their party, as, as villainous as he comes across sometimes, he has no problem wading into a superior number of foes and fighting his heart out for the team. Uh, you know, he knows he could die, but he still does it. And that's where I say, like, Derek, the guy I'm talking about, and Ron, the elf, you know, druid, ranger kind of guy, they... they run the risk every time they go into battle and they do so unhesitantly and to have the gnome character who is i guess he's the he's the mc he's supposed to be your point of view from things um be a little wishy-washy it bugs me that he's not braver or he doesn't try harder sometimes when he does try harder he comes out pretty awesome i mean he, he knows he's not the best fighter and most times his attacks don't do jack so i really wish he would get like a weapon that would allow him to actually harm somebody sometimes and that he would be able to, how do I put this, route more people than what he actually does. So I don't know. It just seems like he, he needs to kick more ass than what he does and, and not be so wishy-washy. Because he never has any confidence in himself, ever. Um, I would also like to see more of Derek, the semi-evil fighter of the group. The guy with the black alignment, or the dark alignment, or however you want to put it. Uh, we get enough of the goblin, the gnome, and the elf. I mean, believe me, Marigold is mentioned probably every third or fourth sentence. Um, Ron and Derek seem to be the guys who are a little underrepresented. And I always point to Dragonlance. I mean, it's like one of the greatest series ever written. Uh, it blows me away that it is not touted as one of the best fantasy series. I mean, the first six books are, that's it. That's all I should have written was the first six books. Left it alone after that, it would be the greatest fantasy series of all time. I mean, it is brilliant. And especially the last three books in the series. Uh, just incredible. It is just intense. But Dragonlance literally gives each character a spotlight at some point uh, during each book. So you'll see, like, you know, Tasselhoff does this, and Raceland does that, and Caramon does this, and even Tika and Lorelana, and, and, you know, you go through the whole list of characters, no matter who they add in, they're given moments to shine. And really, Ron kind of just becomes... Uh, the guy that tells you, here's how the game is played, and this is the right thing to do. And Derek becomes the, I'm going to make a, a, a inappropriate remark here and do something sneaky or snarky here, but I'm still going to go out and do what I need to do to keep everybody alive. And that's great, but I would like to see a little bit more centered on them doing things too, rather than, you know, Marigold with Petey or the Gnome, or the Half Goblin. As much as I love the Half Goblin, by the way, I really like his character a lot. Kirby, he's he's cool. Um, but you really need to spotlight a little bit more. And, I, and I'm only saying this because I enjoy all of the characters. I enjoy each one of them. I mean, Ron's a little stiff, but I mean, that's his character. That's it. That's who he is. That's who he is supposed to be. He is the hero who will not bend. You know, that's, that's the whole point to the whole thing. And... I think that there should be a little bit more time for each person set aside as you go through the story. So the only real complaint, and I say this with love because I do enjoy this book, is that a lot of the humor from the first book, either it didn't come across as well this time, or it's a little bit lacking. Now granted, most of the jibes in the first book centered on Marigold's bosom, shrinking clothing, and so on, but it was funny, and it really fit the feel of the series. Uh, here, this was a bit more grim and gritty uh, as you go through it. And I'm all for grim and gritty. But if the first book is funny and I, I laugh at things, I expect to have like similar moments in the next book, the next series. And and that was kind of missing. I mean, they do make some jibes here and there. But the, the real issue for me was, you know, um, how Marigold kind of flipped everything on everybody because 
she was really upset at how much leering was being done or how they were talking about her. Um, and if they did have a naughty thought, the people, after they got to hear how she felt, they reprimanded themselves, well, except for Derek, of course, because he's, he's dark aligned. But the entire thing just kind of went into a more of a, a more somber tone than what I would have liked. And, and I'm not saying that it's a bad way, but like I say, first book had humor, humor, humor in it and right in the right spots. Now, I don't know if, if Terry just felt it didn't fit through most of the book or through certain spots, but I think there were a bit of points like when they, they kill the goblins, let's say, and you know they're talking about where to hide the bodies and there's the head and this. That would have been a good spot for some really good humor, but they were totally totally deadpan serious the entire time. And to me, I just needed some more laughs. And it doesn't always have to be at Marigold's expense or or making fun of, you know, the, the, the racial traits of the gnome or the goblin. There should be other things that kind of bring it out. But again, to me, you know, the whole premise in the first book was Marigold was set up to be like this super hot, triple porn star hot, you know, um, massively bosom character. And like I say, it makes you, the reader, feel ashamed for laughing or even considering the same situations to be funny by the second book. Um, you know, when Marigold is reduced to com complain shaming uh, the others, you know, more than worrying, you know, she does that and she complains about her bird Petey more than anything. So either she's shaming you for finding, you know, her situation funny or she's worrying about her bird. And like I said, her character went from being an interesting, funny character to, yeah, she's there, and I, I just, I, I don't mind her, um, but she's got a lot of potential because she has the <clears throat> monk abilities as an addition to her spellcasting powers, and she's swapped out some things for spellcasting powers, so she's got more more strength uh, as they leveled. Um, either way, I really enjoyed this book, and I look forward to the next one. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't want you to think that I keep harping and if you've watched these shows you know like what i end up doing is is i nitpick issues that i have with what's really a great book um, and i can do that because this is the second book you know book two i'm allowed to say okay i love book one i enjoy book two a lot but here's where i'm going to say this needs tweaked or fixed or whatever or it just didn't sit well with me and i, I think it's okay because i'm not harming the book or the series in any way uh, especially if it's a good one if it's a bad one i have no problem just saying the book was crap and here it is and this is not that case at all um and, and i have to say that there was a couple things that i really loved that he added into the story like I enjoyed very much how they were shown to be leveling up via dreams that they had, where they would dream and they would see their character sheets, and they were able to add, you know, new skills like swimming and different things while they were asleep and go on with their lives because they can't access their character sheets in the real world. While they're actually living and fighting and doing all that, they can't just say, hey, let me see my character sheet and see where I'm at XP-wise. They cannot do that. And they never know where they are XP-wise. But the Half Goblin pretty astutely figures out where everybody stands XP-wise by how much XP it takes for each of their classes or races to level. So he basically tells Marigold, you've got a long way to go before you can get yourself leveled up. So on and so forth. Um, and another thing that I really liked about the, the, the story was how they know how many hit points they have instinctively you know they're like man i just got away with that by two hit points that's all i had left and and it was nice that they knew that instinctively rather than guessing i'm really hurt and i have no idea how bad it is they knew they knew automatically they knew if it was going to kill them by bleeding out or if it was just going to heal when they were going to be wounded for a while so on and so forth so they know but they instinctively know where they stood HP wise. Okay. So I, I appreciated so many things about this book. Um, I just must say that I had no, no issue with the more action oriented take that it had, but I would have liked to have more humor. Um, either way, even though the book, um, didn't have that funniness that I needed and I picked a few things apart, I still think it was a really, really good book. And I'm only going to take it like a point off just because, um, it was a 7.9 for me. And and, I, and again, I'm going to go back and say, technically, um, the narration by Jonathan Waters was just as 
good as it was the first time. I don't want you to think I skipped over him, but but Waters really, really hits every character the same way he did the first time. He keeps the pacing up. He keeps the action up. When there was humor, he put the humor into it and did the inflections for the humor properly. He was really slick on how he did it. I enjoyed him a lot as a narrator. So I didn't take anything off for the narration. And again, for me, it was my expectations of a little bit more humor that weren't there. And if it had been bumped up a little bit, I would have given it a straight eight right across the board, just like the first time. Uh, and, you know, at least it was at least an eight then. I would have done the same thing here. Um, I just had to knock it off a little bit because I was a little disappointed with that. Um, but either way, I still so very much look forward to the next book in the series. I know it's on Audible, so that's on my list of things to get next. Uh, I hope it will be on your list of things. You should really go out and get this book and enjoy it because it is well worth your time and listening. So the next book I'm doing is called Seductive Seas, Online Swashbuckling Harem. Uh, it is book one in the series. It's written by Calico Jack, narrated by Shane Morris, with a book length of 58 minutes. A howl of rage erupted from the man's throat, and he blindly swung his sword around. Ducking low to avoid it, Dietz drove the jagged sword fragment up, catching Carl in the underside of his chin and lodging itself there. Blood spurted in several directions, and Dietz let go of the hilt and stepped back. Still blind from the sand, Carl staggered around for a few moments before sinking to his knees. Dropping his sword, he clumsily flailed at the hilt sticking out of the bottom of his face. Looking paler by the moment, and amidst a growing spot of red-stained sand, Carl finally fell on his face, gave a final twitch, and died. So this was like a really odd book to review. I think you would know by now, I am always on the lookout for a good lit RPG short story and pretty much jump at one whenever I get the chance. If I can find a good lit RPG story anywhere, um, a short story, I will grab it just because I want to have a really awesome lit RPG short. It's just, it's one of those rare elusive beasts that you, it's like the Loch Ness Monster of Bigfoot. You know they're out there, you know they're real, at least I do. Um, anyway, you know they're out there, but you very rarely ever see one in the wild. So, scanning through Audible one day, I found this book. And I said, 58 minutes, short story, lit RPG. I got to get it. I got to do this. So, I picked it up. Now, the issue that I have, oh my gosh, is that this is sort of a hard sell for me. The book is pretty short. It's only 58 minutes long. And I just said to you, I'm looking for what? Say it loudly, guys. A short story, right? I am. I'm looking for a short story. Um but at only 58 minutes long, this really only feels like a first chapter more than it does a complete short story. There's just something about this that tells me there's nothing completed yet, or it's the beginning to a bigger story. And considering it's part one of a series, I don't know if there, that's going to be like, this is the, the introduction to the series, and then Wham! will have a bigger, longer novel. I don't know. It's really hard to tell. But to me, this doesn't feel like it's a short story. This feels more like an introduction to a fuller story. Um, and if that makes any sense at all, and like I say, to me, it's more of a first chapter than it is anything else. Um, I don't know. There, there just should have been more that happened. I think if you had added another hour's worth of material, that it would have been it wouldn't have been too bad for a short story. But it was just too much all jammed in at once together to make it a complete coherent story that didn't feel rushed and overwhelmed and shortchanged you in certain areas. And I'll get to that because to me, I, I felt shortchanged with the lit aspect of it. And there was, there was issues with sex. And there was actually one part to the whole thing that I actually thought, man, I don't know why more writers don't take this idea and run with it. Cause this is a really smart idea, but it just it just had things that just drove me crazy as I listened because it didn't explain a whole hell of a lot. Now, for example, the story or the tale, because it's on the high sea, so it's always a high seas tale, not a high seas story. It, it's a tale that starts off with the main character walking the plank. And I'm going to be honest with you. I listened to this not very long ago, and I can't remember any of the characters' names. None. So it's just going to be the MC. 
All right. And that just tells me how much the short story stuck in my head because it didn't. It really didn't. I mean, I can tell you things about it, but there was so much jammed into that little bit of time that characters' names were not overwhelming any more than, like, you know, what game mechanics were. So that's just, that's one of those things I have to say. Anyway, he ends up walking the plank. So it seems, and and again, I'm going to say it seems like his old ship has mutinied, his old ship, because he was the captain, apparently, and he's been replaced and is being left to drown by his former crew. Now, somehow, he manages to make it to a newbie starting island. And to be frank with you, I don't remember if he died and respawned, or if he swam to shore, or if he, you know, took his back hair, shaved it, and rode two dolphins to the island. I don't remember. Um, and, and like I said, I just listened to the story. So it's, it's not like I, it overwhelmed me with flashes of, my gosh, this is just great. Um, it was there, and I listened to it, and it was a story. So... That's as good as I can say right now. So somehow he makes it to the newbie starting island, but it's still a level one pirate. Um, so I was confused. I mean, did he actually have the ship that he swore he would get back as they floated away, leaving him in the water? Did he actually captain that ship for a while at level one? Or was he like a higher level and then he died and respawned and became a first level character again? I don't know, it just, it really, you know, did the game start him out that way on a mutiny ship? Because he didn't act like that was the case at all. It was just really, he was very familiar with the the people and the island, like he'd been there before, so he knew the crew, he knew the ship, but he, I don't know. And, and it, it, why was he so low level? That was like my big thing, you know, I just, I don't know, and it never tells you one way or if dying resets you or not, but I can tell you right now, if dying reset you, to level one, I would never play the game. I don't care how great the sex was in the game or the action or the danger or the excitement. I wouldn't play it. It would be like one of those games where I'm like, why would I invest any time in this game? I say that all the time, you know, but again, it's never really explicitly explained. So I don't know if that's the case or not. I really don't have a clue. And that's one of my downfalls right off the bat. If I can't tell you a reason for something, there's an issue. So te- 10 seconds basically after he arrives on the island, he is met by this comely wench who had originally been part of his crew, it seems. And she followed him. And I guess she just jumped overboard or she stole a boat. No, she stole a boat. Because, you know, I know she stole a boat because she said the name of the boat like 58 times in about four paragraphs. It was so repetitive, it drove me crazy. And I can't even tell you what the name of the boat was. I know it starts with a P, and it's not pontoon, but that's about it. But they said the name of that boat enough that it should be indelibly burned into my brain cells. But again, there was just nothing about this book. Again, uh, nothing. There was one really cool idea, but nothing about this book really stood out or, or smacked me upside the head. And I was like, holy crap, this is great. I didn't get that impression. I mean, it just it didn't do it to me. So, anyway, she she follows him to this island. Now, immediately upon meeting him, um, she begins pleasuring him orally. Um, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. I don't mean she was reading Shakespeare's sonnets. So, if you don't get it from that, I don't know what else to say. But this is where the first snafu really comes into play. Because um, the narration says something, and forgive me, I can't remember it verbatim. But it said, she said it, something like this. Um, she slid his massive member into his mouth. Now, yes, I read that right. Okay, or I said that right. She slid his massive member into his mouth. And I'm thinking, I know that's not what they meant. It should have been her mouth. But the way it came across was, like, this captain here should have been called Captain Longspear if he could do that. Okay, and if he could do that, what did he need her to help him with? Because, you know, uh, you don't need anybody else's help if you can do that. Right. Okay. Words matter, people. You got to check your stuff. Words is hard. I know words is hard. They are very hard. They make me strain my mind. But her and his really, really mattered in this instance. Okay, and I don't mean to beat this up. But in an intimacy scene between two people, you got to know who's doing what to who. That's just the way it is. Uh, You take that out and it just becomes a massive craziness. 
So coming out of that scene, no pun intended, um, he awakes to find he's at work, okay, and that he's played all night, and his hot boss, who he has his eye on because she's super sexy, and he is really, really, really deeply in love with her, um, has set up a meeting with him and some financiers of their game. And she's kind of made it where he's got to demonstrate a couple things. So the first thing he needs to do is demonstrate just like how powerful the fighting system is, like how hard is it, how fun is it, excitement. And then he's got to demonstrate how the sex system works. So he's got to like basically, you know, shag somebody in front of like, 10 or 12 financiers or four or five or whatever you want to think. But it's not something that I would want to take on in the business world because you're always going to be the guy that screwed the VR girl, right? I mean, that's it. They're going to be like, yeah, you know, we really liked what you did over at City Financial there, but um, we don't think we can bring you on because I was there when you were like humping the, the seagull and wench and buddy, your, your technique was just awful. And I just really got to say, it scared me some of the things you did. So I don't think I would perform in that capacity, no matter how badly my boss wanted me to. I just think that that would be like something intimate that I would only do when I was alone. And it also made me think, um, the only thing that this dude wore for the game was a headset. Boop, a headset. That's it. So if he's, he's um, how do I put this delicately? Because I don't want to be overly graphic. But if he is experiencing something that you would call maybe a screaming O, he's got cleanup to do. And he's at work, right? I mean, he's just he's just received some oral pleasures, right? And he's at work. So when he takes his headset off, clearly, unless he, he's not experiencing the whole thing actually physically, and it's all in his head, which, I don't know, that might be good or might be bad. I don't even know how that would work. Uh, logically, if I would enjoy that better, that it was all in your noodle, than it was in your noodle. Um, I don't know. But... Either way, there, there should have been cleanup involved and some sticky situations where he was like, I have to go, I, have to, I, I need to clean a little, okay? That never comes up. So it's just one of those things where I had to ask what went on. And again, it's just one of those things where nothing is ever explained and it's kind of left for you to figure out, I guess. Or maybe it'll be explained later. I don't know. And again, when I have to ask questions, when I need to figure out where this was going then there's an issue. There's a problem. Uh, and I don't like to have problems. I shouldn't have to think, you know, what if this or what if that. They, they should tell me because my last thing I should be doing is being taken out of a book to figure out what's going on in the book. Right? I mean, I should be able to say, okay, Superman can fly. Why can he fly? Because he's an alien and he goes off into space. Okay? That's just the way it should work. And here, they don't give you a lot of information because it's 58 minutes. And they've got a five-minute setup with he's on he's on the plank and getting to the island. And then he has sex and he gets to the, 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 the meeting with his boss, so on and so forth. So every piece is, is just short little things snipped together that you've got to glean things, you know. And for a 58-minute story, I shouldn't have to work that hard. It should be pretty much... Just a fun little exercise. And and that, to me, it was not a fun little exercise. So that's pretty much the whole story, aside from what actually happens in gameplay and how the meeting went. And I don't want to spoil everything, because it's a pretty short story. And I could probably tell you the whole thing inside of about three minutes, and you would have an idea of everything that happened. So, you know, not a lot of content if you consider all the time and set up a took just to get to that one point I just told you about. So it feels truncated. It feels shortened. And like I say, it, it's a good start to a bigger tale, but not so hot for a one shot. And, and that's what it, it really is. It just seemed to be like it was a one shot story that leads into other stories somewhere along the line because it didn't tell me a whole lot of anything. Now, the story did, and I will say this, did have a couple of cool ideas that I would like to see implemented in other harem or sexy style books. Uh, and that was in which the players kind of have to unlock the wench NPC's chastity belts with a quest. And that was actually pretty smart, because this way, uh, they can't just get busy. They have to actually do a little work before they can have some fun. Now, of course, this still didn't stop the sexy wench from providing some world gratification, as I said, right after they met. It just meant that the honeypot was sealed. Yes, sir, Pooh could not get to the honey. 
until they figure out a way to unlock that key. And there, there are ways of doing that. And it's either through quests or acquiring items. So I love this concept. Uh, and, and again, this is supposed to be a setup for a harem style because the first thing that they say is basically the, the sea captains are supposed to gather a bevy of babes uh, around them. And that's the whole thing. So they've got to figure out how to get these belts or these locks off of them so they can go through the whole experience. Um, I just wish it was featured more in other novels because every other lit RPG harem book that I read, there, there's never a, a strain or a stress to get to the sex. They just pretty much have the sex. And I grant you, the majority of those is because um, even though it's a lit RPG, I'll just, I'll go with, let's just say super sales for superheroes, not an overly sex filled book, not bad. I love the book, but it's not based on, you know, they have to have rules and regulations for sex to occur. They're, they're really living in that world. Uh, and they just have lit rules applied to them. So that doesn't really count. Uh, but Something like if you went to like Planet Kill, okay, with, with Jamie Hawk, um, maybe there, maybe there, you could have like that kind of chassis belt implemented to help you, you know, get that game going. So I don't know. This was a pretty cool concept for me. I enjoyed it a lot, uh, but that was really the only major thing I said. Man, that's that's pretty slick. I enjoyed that. The narration was fair to Midland. I'm in Ohio again. I'm back. Well, I'm always in Ohio, but I'm in the backwoodsy country Ohio parts. I'm down in the valley now, so I'm going to say fair to Midland. Mm -hmm. It wasn't overly underwhelmed, but you know, um, the narration. I can't say I was amazed at it neither. Uh, there was also there was this strange ticking or clicking or tapping. I don't know what it was um, in the first ten minutes of the book. It'd be like, and then he went somewhere, and then this happened, and then this. And I was like, what the hell is that? Because it had no tie to, like, um, if you listen to, you know, something like Nick Podell's doing a new book, um, and it's really good, and he, he has these really cool sound effects to it uh, every time they, they level up or stuff. It had nothing to do with leveling or character powers or, I mean, nothing. It had nothing to do with that whatsoever. Um, so I was a little shocked at what that was. I don't know what it was at all. It just came and randomly appeared out of nowhere, and it vanished with no say. I don't know where it was from. So, my final score is a 6.5. And it might have been higher if there was more to the story. Um, if they had fleshed it out a bit more. But I can't justify you using a credit for a book that's under an hour. I really can't. It's just not worth your time or effort. Uh, it's just not there for you to do. You, you want to waste a credit. For a 58-minute book, that's on you, that is. But I'm going to say, do not waste your credits. And if you think about it, this was like maybe 15,000 words in total. It, you know, 58 minutes. There's no way it was more than 16,000, 17,000 words. And you have to ask yourself, you pay basically on Amazon for an ebook, like $3.99 or $2.99 for an ebook. that's 80,000 to 100,000 words. So why would you pay basically $3 or $4 for 58 minutes worth of an audiobook? It's basically 16,000 words. It doesn't make sense. Um, and that's why I'm here to protect you from having that happen. Um, you know, like you said, if you want to try it out, try it out. Uh, you know, I actually should have gone back and looked on Amazon and seen if it had been released as an ebook just to see how much it was it was going for because, you know, I've written short stories and I, I put them basically straight into KU just for free. You know, I, I don't try to sell them, uh, you know, for anything. And even if, when I did, when I, I, before I knew how to put them into KU, I only had them up for 99 cents because that was like the lowest I could go, I do believe. And so, you know, with that, uh, I really had to say, you know, what is the cost versus the worth of that spending? And to me, this is not worth $3.99, $2.97, whatever it was, for 58 minutes. Because I don't know if this was a prologue, it was a short story, or the first chapter of a book. And when a listener cannot make so simple a distinction, the book sort of sails away from me. 
for you, the listener. So the lit elements themselves were also really light, which was a good thing because if it was heavy, I guess, uh, then it would have expanded well past an hour and it would have just been numbers or crunching going on and it would have lost even more story. So I can't complain that it was light on the lit stuff even though it was light on the lit stuff. It really didn't go into a whole lot of game mechanics. So, I mean, 6.5, that's me being really generous because the story is fairly coherent in what it's trying to do. It just didn't give itself enough space to tell the whole story. And that's the issue I have with that book is there should have been more, you know, if just double the amount of words you did, and it could have been a really good story. And it would have been a really good short story. And there's nothing wrong with a 30 or a 40,000 word count short story. I think you can pull it off, make it really fun, exciting, and interesting. And bam, there you have it. So, 6.5. Yeah, what is best in life? To read lit RPG, to see all other genres driven before it, and to hear the lamentations of their fanboys. Yeah. Mm, now this is where we get to the meat and taters of the stories today. Mm, I really like this here book I'm going to tell y'all about. It's like French fried taters. Mm -hmm. Yep, really good. Mm -hmm. So today, I'm going to tell you all about Dan the Barbarian, Gold Girls and Glory by Hondo Jenks. Narrated by the amazing Andrea Parsnow with a book length of 9 hours and 20 minutes. Dan took a step backward. He was terrified, but also too amazed and curious to run. The mist formed into the shape of a huge man, easily eight feet tall and packed with muscle. As the man's features coalesced, the purple mist thinned, spinning round and round the huge figure. The spinning mist lowered, revealing a golden turban, a huge head with a handsome bronze face punctuated by dark, amused eyes. The swirling vapor dropped lower still, revealing more of the huge man, until it reached his waist, where it stabilized, whirling slowly in a purple tornado that stretched from the mouth of the gem-encrusted bottle to the golden belt of the humongous man. Above this belt rose a muscular, bronze-skinned giant dressed in a golden vest. His mustachioed face split into a wide grin that shone as brightly as a scimitar flashing with desert sunlight. Thanks for releasing me, kid. So holy Hannah has Hondo hardly hit some hellacious heights with his breakout game lit novel. Dan, the barbarian. You know, what is good in life? To read this story. To have Andrea Parsnell narrate this story. And to finish this story and feel like you want to be a barbarian. That is what's best in life. This was one heck of a ride. Uh, it was packed with fun, excitement, action, and saucy babes. Now, there aren't enough lady folk here, just to give you a warning now, because I know someone's going to tell me about it. There aren't enough lady folk in this right now to qualify as a harem just yet. Two ladies are a love triangle. Not a harem, but I'm sure from just what Hondo has laid out, a harem is an inevitability. It is an inevitability. So let me just tell you, the story starts out with a schlub named Dan. Um, he's pretty much having a really, really bad day. The worst day of his life. He's kind of like Lane Myers from Better Off Dead, you know, who's being hounded from every angle about his horrible life with his girlfriend and somebody needs two dollars and his job sucks and his mom is a horrible cook and his neighbor is just this icky guy and you just name it and his best friend is booger from revenge of the nerds that tells you his life sucks so that's dan that's dan in a nutshell i mean he is spot on lane myers down the line everything he does just crumbles to crap and if it doesn't crumble to crap it falls on top of his head like manure I hate manure. Okay, that is who Dan is. From start to finish, he is just a major loser who's having a crappy, crappy, crappy day. He's failing a class, he's robbed, and he shatters this really expensive looking glass case in the school library. Now, fortunately for Dan, in this little accident, he accidentally frees a genie. Now, this genie, and I hate to say this, really, really reminded me of 
Burl Ives in The Brass Bottle, which also coincidentally starred Barbara Eden, who also played I Dream of Genie Genies. Did I say that right? She played the genie in I Dream of Genie? Either way. So you got two genies for the price of one in a whole movie with Tony Randall. And Tony Randall is pretty much Dan. Okay? So, you know, you, you put that together and check out the, 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 the movie sometime. It's actually pretty funny. Um, and it may not be a, a groundbreaking movie, but, uh, you know, as old movies go, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, the genie in his ever amazing infinite generosity decides to grant Dan one wish in spite of Dan's, uh, contentions that he's supposed to get three wishes. The genie doesn't really give him any choice. He's like, look, you want a wish? You got a wish. One wish. And you got to make this quick because I got people to kill, places to go, things to do. So make a choice. Let's move it. Move it. Move it. So Dan sits there and he scratches his head for a moment. And the genie's like, damn it, man. Let's go. You got a second. And he's like, well, wait, wait. No, no, no. Time is up. I'm just going to do something for you. And he's like, no, no. Here's what I want. And he basically says, give me a life like my barbarian character, Wolfgar. That is what I want. I want to live a life of adventure and excitement like Wolfgar would. So the genie is like, boom, your wish is granted. I'm out of here. And I'm not even comparing him to any way to, to Robin Williams' genie because that's just a stupid, horrible genie. Okay, This genie is pretty tough. He's pretty cool. So wish granted, Dan now finds himself in a mirror world in which his college no longer teaches things like economics, psychology, or biology. Instead, there's stuff like I don't know, Treasure Hunting 101, Sword Play, Dungeon Delving. Those are the sorts of classes that he gets. Okay. Now, of course, Dan still lives across the hall from the hottest girl in the school, Holly. Oh, my gosh. She's such a hot babe. Holly is so hot. He loves Holly. Okay. Uh, he is pined for Holly, and she doesn't know who he is or who he, or if he even exists, or at least in the old world. Okay. Now, um, his nasty teacher, the one that rips up his papers and tells him, you know, you're going to fail. Um, she's here too. Lucky Dan. So he doesn't get that much of a break. He gets this really scabby, nasty old teacher and she hates him here just as much as she did there. So upside his independent study teacher is no longer his, his I hate you so much. I'm going to fail you intentionally. She at least gives him a chance to do some study and tell her about something on based on a book that she wrote. I don't know if that's an upside or not. But he still has Holly across the hall, right? So there's there's that. Um, but Dan gets help from his magical sword that actually has the character's personality of Wolfgar. Uh, and he gets to know a group of people, and he actually ends up joining with his hot neighbor, Holly, you know, through some certain things. And they end up going into a, a college quest game that has real life and death stakes to them. The characters are fun, and they play to type. Dan, for example, um, he pulls a lot of stupid stunts, just like a real dopey barbarian would. The thief is sexy and sneaky and slick. I liked her a lot. Um, Holly, is, to me, Holly was just okay. I think she was just there for the hotness factor. She didn't overwhelm me as, like, she's got all this power, but she was super hot and seductive, and that was what everybody saw about her. Um, so that was it. Uh, then there's this scatterbrain mage, um, you know, who has a pet monkey. And he really reminded me a lot of Fizban from the Dragonlance series. So again, you're going to see, I've been mentioning Dragonlance a lot lately. There's a reason for that. Dragonlance is the penultimate. They have crazy wizards. They have serious wizards. Well, this wizard is more of the crazy wizard variety. And I mean, cool. Kind of crazy. All right. So the story is not, let's be realistic about it. It's not overly complicated. It is about a barbarian after all. But damn it, if it wasn't a fun read. I listened to this book and just chortled and chuckled and laughed. And I was right there with them as they were going through their quest stuff and having fun. I, I enjoyed it. And it kept me hooked until I finally wrapped it up. And I can only say that Dan was, <laughs> I can only say this. Dan was a very relatable character, for me at least. Now, I couldn't place myself in his exploits. I mean, I'm not a barbarian, but I will say that I liked how Dan had memories of the old world 
and having grown up in the new world. So he didn't like have his old memories of the old world erased. They were kind of like side by side. He's like, I remember growing up, let's just say in the Bronx. And I, I remember growing up in the dark woods. So, you know, that was right there. Okay. And, and it was pretty nice. And the book also features a monkey, Zuggy, who is a chess playing beer swinging fool that gets a little belligerent if he isn't given a proper beverage. Now, what is with these monkeys lately anyway? I mean, I keep saying, never trust a monkey. No one listens. They keep showing up book after book. Last book, last review I did was Banjo from, you know, Steamless Wiley. Here we got Zuggy. Um, and, and the book really, really has a solid, solid ending that sets up the next novels and helps keep the anticipation going so far as we have to wait, you know, for pretty much the only reason why we have to wait is that Andrea Parsonal has to record. I mean, they're written. I think we're heading into book four right now. So I don't have many books are in a series, but we're, we're getting pretty close. I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe five books in a series. But right now it's on Andrea to get this series done. So Andrea, please move it along, shall we? I can't wait forever. Uh, now, speaking of Andy P, man, oh man, does she ever do an incredible tale telling Dan's story. The job she does is just intense. Now, I'm going to make just a wee bit of a confession. So don't tell anybody. It's just between you and us, okay? You and me. I have passed up so many audiobooks in the past because they were read by female narrators. All right? And I don't want to say that like I'm proud. I'm actually very ashamed of that. But the reason for that is pretty simple. I listen to... I've always listened to audiobooks. In fact, I go back to... I'll give you the book that really set me off from female narration. I listened to Silence of the Lambs as it was read by Kathy Bates. And I was so underwhelmed with her performance and so unimpressed that I, I just said I, that was a bias that I, I gained because I had a couple bad experiences. But her reading of that was so horrible, so horrible. I just could not believe that she had been given the job to do that. Just could not believe it. Uh, and I wished that somebody else had done it. I know they've had other people come in and do it later, but I don't even want to read the book, listen to the book anymore just because of the way she, she ruined it for me. And, and I'm a book person over movie person anytime, but I will watch that movie a thousand times before I will ever crack a page or put an earbud in my head and listen to it ever again, ever again. She, she killed that for me. So the bias that she instilled upon me has been carried through many, many a year. And this was back in the early 90s. I mean, you think about when that, that audiobook came out, it was really either the late 80s, early 90s. I think it came out in 87. No, it was in the 91, I think. But either way, it was in the early 90s. And I've had that, that problem for years. For years, I, I just refused. If I saw a book had a female narrator, right on to the next one. I didn't care who the author was. I skipped it. Just the way it went. And I have bought a ton of audiobook MP3 CDs over the years. I have CDs, MP3s. It's not like I just jumped onto Audible and, you know, because I just learned Audible existed and said they have audiobooks. I actually fought Audible because I used to listen to nothing but CDs in the car. And the other reason why I switched was because my boss got a car that didn't have a CD player anymore. So I had to have something I could plug in and I used my phone to do that. So I needed an Audible account to get books. So I switched over from MP3 CDs to Audible. And I'm really glad I did. But even then, going into Audible, I still would not listen to a female read me a book. <sighs> so I didn't care. If the MC was female, I just didn't do it. And then I listened to Andrea Parsnow. Now, Andrea Parsnow changed my mind. And to be fair, I'm going to tell you how it happened. I am pretty oblivious to most things as a consumer. And I tend not to really look at what I buy. It's one of my biggest downfalls is I see something, I pick it up, and I throw it in my cart, and I walk on. And I don't care if I do that on Amazon or if I do that in the Walmart or, you know, wherever I am. I just say, okay, this is something I want. Boom, it goes in. I don't look to see what comes with it, what doesn't come with it, or who does it or whatever. If I see a book, like if I read, like, you know, The Legends of Ethshar, and Ethshar is there, I will pick up Legends of Ethshar and put that in the cart because Lawrence Watt Evans is an amazing writer. Now, I would have picked it up 
and listened to it and found out that it had a female narrator. And I'd have been really pissed. Now, that's not what happened, but I'm just saying that was how it happened. And I can't remember what the, what the first book I heard Andy do actually was. But I picked it up, didn't see that this was narrated by a woman. And the problem was I started the book. Okay. Now, for me, that's a big deal. The first time I crack open a book or the first word comes off of that audible recording, I have to listen to it. I have to. That is a rule I instilled myself as a child. I would never, ever, ever walk away from a book once I started it. Sometimes I might put them on a shelf for a little while. Um, like I did that with The Sword of Shannara. I read about half of the book with The Sword of Shannara because I had read The Elfstones first. And The Elfstones was so amazing. I said, I because I, I had gotten it through the Science Fiction Book Club. I said, oh, now I got to get The Sword of Shannara, Shannara to see how all this came into play. And The Sword of Shannara was that thick, and it was this full of crap compared to the Elfstones. It was all set up in drudgery and snore, 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 snore. Then I just said, I will come back to this book later. And it was five years later before I finally said, I have to finish this book. Have to. So I soldier, soldiered on and did it. And it was the same thing here. I turned it on, and I heard this lady doop, doop, in my ear. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? Why? That was my word. Why? I kind of got horsey there. But anyway, I, I did that and I said, well, I'm going to listen. I, I, I have had this thing since I was f four years old. You start the book, you finish the book. So, you know, I didn't leave like, you know, any, you know, cat in the hat books unfinished. I read them and I, I got through them. So I, I, I sat there and I, I won't say I had to force myself because Andrea Parsnow captivated me. She, I wish I could think of the book off the top of my head, what it was that I listened to her with. And I, I'm going to kick myself because as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to say, oh, of course it was. And, and I don't remember right off the top of my head. But it, it'll come to me. And I'll, I'll probably put it in the comment section somewhere in the, the YouTube page after it's all said and done with. But right now I can't come up with it. Anyway, I found her to be fascinating fascinating she was so on point with different things and the way she worded things um, and her emotional capacity carried over so well that I found myself enjoying the book and from that point on I've been a fan of Andrea's and she proves that a woman can narrate a story no matter the gender of the MC so kudos for Andy for expanding my horizons now as for her work on Dan the Bee well, what can I say? She hasn't slowed down any. You know, I'm not going to say, well, she was really great on that first book that I had no idea she was going to read. And now she's just falling apart. Hell no. She is really great. She continues every time I listen to her to improve on her craft. She makes Holly seductive, Dan manly, and Zuggy monkeyer than monkeys should be. Even monkeyer than Banjo. But to be fair, Banjo was a synthetic monkey. Zuggy is a real monkey. He's just a beer drinking monkey. That's all. So she really runs with this book and I enjoyed listening to her every second of her performance. She just has a total flair for action, but her biggest thing is the emotion that she slips in. And I, I say this every time I listen to Somnia, there are parts in Somnia online where I just say, I know and I'm waiting for this to come out because there are things I'm like, there is an emotional thing happening here. And I know it's going to happen. And it's because of the way Andrea does stuff. Uh, you know, Andrea Parsonow just lays it out there, but does it so subtly that you don't realize you are catching that information until afterwards. And it's pretty slick the way she does that. I mean, like, she is a smooth operator. Sade, like, smooth operator. Okay. She is slick and smooth. And I give her a lot of credit because there's not a lot of narrators, male or female, who can pull off the stuff she does. And as I always say, Jeff Hayes just nails the female voices that he does. She nails the male voices. It's a pretty good swap. I'm like, wow, she, she can go toe to toe with the heavy hitters because she is a heavy hitter. She is. She's a heavy hitter. So I really, really appreciate her. So uh, final score for this is 8.2 stars. 
I did catch a couple plot holes. I hate to say it like that, but there were some plot holes. And I thought that there might have been a few options that they could have handled a little differently or better. There were things I thought, why did they just do this? But again, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because Dan is a barbarian and he's supposed to be a little bit slow in the thought field. You know, he's not not ridiculously stupid, but he's also not the smartest potato in the bin. Okay, so for me, the only part that really seemed like it was just extra writing, and I hate extra writing. Like when you you read something, you go, "This was just thrown in either for word count or to fill out something," or or, there was no reason for it. Was the will they won't they play the chess match? That to me, as soon as it came up, and it was they said chess, you know what's going to happen, you know who's going to do what. There was never a question or a surprise. But it still played out that way, and it just kind of bugged me a little bit. So I did shave a point off of that one um, because I needed to just actually have the, the story be the story. I hate like uh, like Awaken Online where they go through the trials, and this was like one of those things where they go through trials, and they weren't doing too poorly with it. It was going pretty well up until that point, and they mired down right there. So that to me that was just that was a, the one slow spot that didn't need to be slow. It should have never even had a ever had any kind of conversation about it. It should have been like we know what's going to happen here, just go do it, and it made it look a little bit more complicated or something. I don't know, but either way, this was a really fun book, and I love game lit novels so much. I love them. You know that's why mazes, magic, and mazes, magic, and monsters. Uh, you know. I love that series. I love the Joel Rosenberg, the, the Guardians of the Flame. Uh, this is one of those things that I just say, this is, is a top-notch game lit story, and you, you give it a try. That's all I can tell you. Give it a try, and you will find yourself in another world, knee-deep, no, not knee-deep, neck-deep into swords. So give it a shot. You'll really like this book. Okay, so today I'm going to do What Else Have They Done? Now this one, even though it's by Harmon Cooper, I'm going to tell you this is about Andrea Parsno's narration. Okay, this is why I chose this book. Because I, I listened to her do Dan the Barbarian, and I've, I've listened to a bunch of her other stuff, and I said, you know, she doesn't get the spotlight as much as she deserves. So Cooper will get something else somewhere along the line. Don't worry, Harmon. I will cover your back, buddy. But today, the What Else Have They Done is Star Spangled Apocalypse by Harmon Cooper, narrated by Andrea Parsno, with a book length of 8 hours and 26 minutes. The morning of the explosion that would change the city of Austin, Texas forever was of little significance to James Sinclair. Since moving to Austin, Texas a little over a year ago, his life had been slow, dry, and above all, boring. Fucking liberal ass city. There was that, too. He came to Austin to escape Colorado, and it was definitely on the list of stupid moves he'd made. Costly, too. James Sinclair was originally from Prison City, Texas also known as Huntsville, which was a city a little over an hour north of Houston that got its nickname from the five state prisons that sat on the city's perimeter, reminding those that inhabited the relatively hilly area that the eyes of Texas were upon them. Indeed. As soon as James had set foot in Austin, the United States had reinstated the draft, something he was still upset about, but not for the usual reasons. Because of America's demand for caffeine, the United States had entered a special clause in Executive Order 88021 that granted draft immunity for citizens skilled as baristas, provided they had at least a year of experience under their belts. So I'm really glad that this novel has a mushroom cloud on it because it literally blew me away. Uh, There are so many things that go on here that I didn't expect and had no idea that Cooper had all of this in him. I mean, granted, he is... He has said that this was one of his earliest novels. So, you know, you think earlier novels, and and I think it was by, you really have that college freshman smell on these pages, by the way. But it comes across as if it had been crafted by a vet. So even though it was an early novel, I I still don't think it was done or seemed like it was done 
by someone who was inexperienced. Uh, this, this is actually a really great book, uh, but this is really far afield of the writing style that we are used to from Marvin Cooper that I know that he uses. And the commentary is so, so, uh, yeah. I just can't find the words. He calls this a satire. But the fact is, this is something I could see playing out between two old friends who are on opposite sides of the political fence. And nowadays, that makes this book even more poignant and significant because I have literally lost friends. And I'm going to put this gently as I can. I am a non-political beast, okay? I, I could care less who is in office, what's going on. There are a few things that I will say I have. Like, I am a hard-on-crime kind of guy. I am not big on criminals getting away or being given anything. So if somebody says, we need to have this, I'm like, nope, just lock them up, throw away the key. That's my stance. And there are a couple other things. And if it has to do with patriotism or pride, my father is a veteran. My grandparents are veterans. My uncles are veterans. So if it comes down to like pride in America, I'm going to be rock solid on that. So I don't care what you do, if it's being disrespectful or disgraceful. I'm not going to back you up. But otherwise, I don't care who's president. I don't care who's speaker of the house. I don't care. In fact, I don't even vote. I don't. You know why? Because I'm in a, in a position in my community where one miscast vote could cost me work. I don't want people to perceive me as being a political entity. So I stay away from politics. Now, I might speak my point of view on something, but I don't use it in, in, a, in a political way. So... Yeah, Cooper keeps it going that way, uh, but he calls this a satire, and it's more like two friends who are now like liberal and right wing having this debate. One's a stoner, the other's a drunk, so you throw in a few side trips and other apocalyptic pieces, and you end up with this witty, biting, unrelenting tale that threatens to make you think if you're just not too careful. Careful. Now, Cooper is funny, and I mean ficking funny as hell, as all get out. Uh, but the humor here is different than his other books. He isn't just being humorous, he is making observations. He throws them at you with punchlines and situations that work really well, too. I hate being preached at, okay? I hate it, uh, whether it's by a priest or a politician. But his commentaries don't feel like you are being talked down to. It's more like, here are my thoughts, I'm happy to share them through this lens of this drunken fellow. Uh, so it's it's pretty neat to see him do that, to give you something to think about regardless of what side of the fence you sit on. Um, but he does it pretty well. Now, another thing he does is he pulls in Andrea Parsonow to narrate. And that's surprising, since basically the story revolves around two dudes. But again, as I just said in my review of The End of the Barbarian, Andrea Parsonow does men as well as women. Wait, that doesn't come out right, and I'm sorry, Andrea, for that. I really, really apologize. Um, you know what I mean, though, right? You know what I mean. So she manages to play men as well as she does the women. And she makes you not notice that bit at all. So it didn't, and until it was all over, I didn't even think that she, there was a woman who had done this. Then all I could think of was what an amazing job she had done. Her voice just worked and elevated the story. So who knew she could do drunk and stone so well, huh? I don't know. Oh, and I just love the retro blast of a cover. It tells you the book isn't serious. All the while, in fact, it is very serious. But it's not serious. It's kind of like Willy Wonka. You know, oh, well, they are going to get it. <laughs> I'm just going with my life. That, that's the best way to put it. And then all I could think of was is that um, the top of the cloud looks like a brain. OK, so that says it all. Uh, you know, if you look at the cover, there's this mushroom cloud, but it's actually a brain. So it's a mind being blown kind of book. The mind is blown. And that's brilliant. And I love that. And I want a copy for my office wall. Harmon Cooper, Andrea, if you guys have a copy, I'd like to put it up on my wall in my office. OK, um, anyway, I really think that Cooper was searching for something deeper when he wrote this book. I don't know if he was looking inward or at the world outside, but the vision he produces and the thoughts he puts forth really fuel this book. And I, I might think this was an esoteric road trip in his own mind as he thought about things sociological and political, but I could also see it as a running train of thought on what is happening in this country today very easily. See, the book has layers like onions and ogres, because ogres have layers and onions have layers and cakes have layers and parfaits have layers. So the deeper you dig in the book, the more you find, and no matter where you stand on the political spectrum, you find something to laugh at and think about. But the truth is, is Andrea really, really carries this book 
with these broad shoulders because if she didn't pull it off, if she couldn't do the humor, if she couldn't do the the, the impersonations, it would have just fell flat. And, and Andrea just loads everything on her back like it is nothing. She's like Atlas with a little ping pong ball on her back rather than the entire world. She carries this easily and effortlessly, and I really am amazed at how well she did this. It's impressive, and I give her a lot of credit because not a lot of narrators could do this. So just to say, Cooper went out of his way to differentiate, differentiate this book from his other sci-fi fare, and even though it is about an apocalypse, it feels more worldly and world wordy world e than anything else I've ever read by him and I could stand to see him do a bit more of this type of book every now and again and I really would like to see Andrea branch out a little bit too and do some other things not that she doesn't do lit RPG and game lit justice she kills it and by the way I just remembered the first book that I ever heard her in was in Don Chapman's Putera I was really impressed with her there so bang there it is. I knew I would get it. It was in Putera. Um, but yeah, she just handles sci-fi as well as anything, and she proves here it doesn't have to be sci-fi. It can be, you know, heavy thinking sort of stuff, and still just blow you away with her ability to carry the book. Um, so, you know, this is one of those occasional hallucinatory road trips I could take every once in a while. And again, I want to say I'm not scoring this book. I don't score what else have they done. If I read it to you, if I'm giving you a review... I've enjoyed the book. I think you will, too. So give it a shot. Give it a listen. You won't be sorry. Well, thank you all so very much for watching, everyone. I do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. If you support us, you can always go on the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page and like us, or on the YouTube page, or just share and like the video. I am going to ask for more... Uh, suggestions for the is it lit segment as well as what else have they done if you've got a favorite lit author who has written something that's not in the lit genre like rr verdi let me know and maybe we can get that onto the show sometime i'm always up for suggestions um i do ask that you please as always leave comments or suggestions in the comment section below uh, and feel free to tell me whatever you like i, I really enjoy the feedback uh, the podcast is sponsored by the Sound Booth Theater, maker of great audiobooks, which can be found at soundbooththeater.com or the facebook.com Soundbooth Theater page. Remember, you can always, as always, always follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon. Our webpage is thelitrpgpodcast.com. And there are some other really good Facebook pages I suggest you look at which would be the Lit RPG Books Facebook page, the Lit RPG Society, and the Fantasy Nation. Uh, I do enjoy you. Uh, if you do enjoy this podcast, please support us. There's a lot of ways to do so. And just going on and saying how much you like the show really, really helps. For the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening. <laughs>